talking about someone we were a big fan of here on the show, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Archbishop yeah. Justin Welby. He was at the Lambeth con- Conference recently, and for those unfamiliar with uh, Anglican speak, the Lambeth Conference is a calling together of archbishops and bishops from around the world to give a lead on where the Anglican Communion, so all the different Anglican churches around the world, However, it is questioned whether such decisions are actually binding. That's a, that's a question that's uh, that's asked. And so there are other groupings of Anglican churches. And just finally, just uh, as a preamble, the Church of England sent out people. There were worshipping communities there, churches there. And so they formed themselves into national churches or perhaps a few different countries together. Sometimes while they were still trying to evangelise, and there were very few converts, but they became churches not established as in a part of the government of the country like they are exclusively in England, but with the same sort of ethos to a certain extent as the Church of England and the same structure, crucially. So you have bishops running the show who are overseers and then you have priests running the local church and deacons serving and helping. So it's a similar sort of setup. Those are different Anglican churches. The Church of England, because of its historic lead, that's where it all started, sees itself as being in charge to a certain extent, sometimes called uh, the first among equals, the Archbishop of Canterbury is, but uh, there are archbishops basically in charge of all these different churches in different areas, and they're meant to be equal to the Archbishop of Canterbury. And they have a meeting which the Archbishop calls them together to, and he pays the expenses well, not personally, no. If Church of England pays the expenses, which I'm not sure it's worth it, but, you know, that's just a personal view. But there are other groupings. There's the Global South who meet together. There are churches, for example, like um, Singapore is one of them. They meet together. And there is GAFCON, which is, I guess, more of uh, the Western world and Africa. Parts of Africa join in with that, don't they? And that's yeah. another grouping where the archbishops and bishops meet together. But the Lambeth Conference happened recently and and the Archbishop of Canterbury was noting that there'd been disagreements. Who'd have thought disagreements, Beryl, within the church? (laughs) The Church of England has had this ever since its inception, I should think. (laughs) Yes. Well, the main disagreement had been over such things as same-sex marriage and the disagreements over it in this Lambeth Conference and, of course, building up to it. I should think before that there would have been disagreements about divorce, wouldn't there? There were disagreements about divorce and there was a big disagreement about whether women should be priests. Yes. Which caused big, big division. And that's when, for example, GAFCON, the grouping that I talked about earlier, that's when that started. Although I'm not sure it has a fixed view on that particular issue. The current issue at hand appears to be same-sex relationships. So we're talking about sexual relationships between a man and man and a woman and woman, whether the church tolerates them, supports them, and at the next level, marries them by redefining marriage, much as has happened, Mm -hmm. for example, in Kingdom. Marriage is now widened in its definition. Some would say has lost its meaning to include same-sex relationships. And that whole discussion has resulted in strong disagreement. And Justin Welby responded to this. He said that the Anglican Communion gathered in the Lambeth Conference has disagreed without hatred. Interesting claim. Last week, he said, we do not hate as our enemies want us to. And may I say, he went on, By God's grace, this week we have a disagree without hatred, not as many in the press want us to. And he referenced a conversation between one of his sons and a journalist friend. And he suggested one editor was disappointed that the disagreement had been so civil. A friend of one of our children, one of our sons, this is Justin Welby speaking, a reporter who is a Christian said, I rejoice and I'm sad. I rejoice because this week I've seen something new, people who disagree loving each other. But my news editor is very sad because there's nothing to say about that. So that's an interesting point. Now, my point that I want to put to you, uh, Beryl, is um, see if you agree with this, have a bit of discussion before we move on to... We're going to talk about uh, the liberal stance on this. But uh, my point of view is this. I'm also disappointed that they're being so civil because I think these are vital issues and you should engage all of the rhetoric at your disposal in order to get your point across. And I think they'd been too nice and mealy-mouthed about it. I suppose it's a difficult issue. I've had disagreements with people in the past, and no matter how nice I've been and how non-argumentative I've been, well, I haven't taken up the argument in a nasty frame of mind, as it were. I've disagreed, but I hope that I haven't been ever hateful 
Mm, yeah. in my disagreement. I think that's important for integrity, but do you find that people will still regard you as being hateful, even though you're not? You're, you're being, yeah, oh uh, yes, making every definitely. effort. definitely. In fact, they would say, if I disagreed with them, that I wasn't being Christian. If you disagree with somebody, it's disagreeable yes. to be disagreeable. This is an issue that's got time and time again, it's, it seems to be a change in culture, that to disagree with them is to personally attack them. Whereas yeah. really, you just say, no, I don't believe what you believe, or mm. I take a different view on this. But there was a, a disagreement I had over this topic, same-sex mm-hmm. marriage, in which I voiced the opinion that same-sex marriage was not really marriage and should not be allowed in church, and that as a, a preacher, as I'm in a church, teaching what it says in the Bible, teaching the church doctrine, the point should be made that uh, sex is exclusive for a man and a woman married for life that's it there is no mm. no other and she was so outraged at this she couldn't look at me and was like she'd been personally attacked this is a woman who is heterosexual married and how it was a personal attack i don't know it was a sort of an extreme version of things i've seen elsewhere that she couldn't even speak for a bit she was so angry whereas i have no power over people who are uh, want to be in homosexual relationships i'm simply saying that i think they shouldn't be in them but i can't stop them i'm not making any attempt to stop them there is no force involved here i'm simply saying this is my point of view and i believe it is exactly what god says so you should stop but i'm not forcing them so this is similar to what we see written in the large scale in political discourse if someone disagrees with you particularly on these sort of issues they are hateful knuckle-dragging cavemen from the past or their dinosaurs, whatever the latest Mm -hmm. metaphor is? Well, I've experienced pretty much the same. We had somebody with whom we had a disagreement about this very same topic. Yes. And we discussed it over dinner in a restaurant that we had paid for. Yes. And she said that she couldn't accept what we said and she had to leave. It's, it's that extreme reaction. This is uh, what I believe, and I think we're in agreement on how you should deal with that sort of situation. We have a different approach that we're going to try and encourage, but we'll come to that in a minute. But it is that extreme reaction that's a problem. So let's just put that back into the church situation. The Archbishop of Canterbury is talking about that, and within the church people would expect people to be so angry to each other, filled with rage in the same way as we've experienced. If it isn't there then that is a good thing, because what we're seeing is uh, Christian charity overcoming this, what we're seeing, hatred. My problem is that it's not true. The Archbishop's claim isn't true. I don't see that. Mm -hmm. I see that the hatred only going one way, but I see the hatred. Uh, The hatred within the church is still those who take what we might loosely call the liberal point of view, that homosexuality is a legitimate expression of sexuality and that um, same-sex marriage should be conducted and encouraged, celebrated by the church. Those people, I don't hate them, and uh, I don't really know anyone who does, from what we might call the traditional point. I think there are people who do hate homosexuals uh, in a very real sense. Oh, I'm sure that that is true. What I'm saying is I don't know anyone. I hear about that sort of thing happening. I don't see it, and certainly in the Church of England discussions that we saw, well, uh, we're traditionalists, I, I, I guess. I that or there are verses in the Bible that if one believed them and acted upon them, you could understand why there was this animosity between same-sex believers and yeah, yeah, uh, non-believers. Uh, uh, yes, what you're referring to is the fact that homosexuality is classed really as a sin, and a deliberate sin has certain sanctions in, in the Old Testament. Mm. We're not talking about New Testament practice, but in the Old Testament, within the nation of Israel, certain homosexual practices were punished by death. Yes, but is that purely Old Testament. I was reading a blog this morning Mm. which has challengers, won't name it, but a text was quoted from the book of Ezekiel that if you see somebody doing something wrong, then you should warn them that they are doing something wrong. It comes from the book of Ezekiel. And is that still true for Christians? What happens to them eternally will be on your... Yeah, no, I I agree with that. My point was that in the church context, the sanction for people not doing what the church teaches them is for them to be shunned, to be removed from communion, excommunicate Mm -hmm. with something called it. 
which saves the homosexual lifestyle and you say well you can't be a member of the church then well they should be happy about that because they're not somewhere where people disapprove of them but there is no sanction to kill them or to punish them in any other way other than remove them from fellowship so since pentecost that first pentecost when the church is made of all who call on the name of the lord all who believe the call to repent is one of persuasion well it's a command but it's a command which you recommend to people and the punishment is done by god not by humans well the listeners will be familiar with the story of ananias and sarah two believers who lied and kept back funds from the church and they died god said that they'd been punished and they died there is no suggestion however that any of the apostles the leaders of the church would say well in that case we're going to beat you to death there was no punishment no, by humans they at all they didn't know what ananias and sapphira they didn't done. know what they didn't know what they'd done and they didn't issue a, a punishment other than to say god is saying that you're going to die <laughs> you know so mm-hmm. the apostle peter knew what was going to happen that was it the punishment comes supernaturally either by god now or after death in the life to come that's the teaching of christianity Yes. There is a reckoning for those who don't do what God says, but it's not to be meted out by human beings in the name of the church. Yes, I am against, for example, the witch hunting of the Middle Ages when they had people accused of being witch and punished, and uh, all those sort of things, or today beating out demons for people. But there was no physical violence, there's no punishment like that to be meted out of people, even fining them. So I think the Archbishop then is right in saying we're not hating in that way. We're not trying to punish people. People who disagree with us, say someone is homosexual, they're saying I should be in a same-sex marriage. There's a discussion about whether that's true or not. The only claim is, and this is what he's trying to stop happening by making his comments, is, as I was saying, the way that the Bible teaches you to deal with this is for you to be thrown out of the church. And so, therefore, as he's talking about people who are the heads of whole churches, you know, archbishops, uh, Mm -hmm. it's talking about throwing a whole church out of being in communion with the Church of England, so breaking up the organisation that he's sort of head of, you know, first of all, that's why he's, I believe, taking the line and saying, no, there isn't that strong disagreement. Yeah, Christians will know, as well as people who are not Christians, who are not believers, that sin exists in other forms other than homosexuality yeah most christians that i know believe homosexuality the practice of homosexuality is a sin yes as is the practice of lesbianism agreed um but we all know that there are other sins that people commit and other sins that are committed in secret as well i mean how often do we proclaim against somebody who is a glutton Yes. For example, somebody eats too much. One of the sins that's mentioned in the list by the Apostle Paul, and this is a major sin, is gossiping. Gossiping and grumbling and murmuring, which are sins which blight many churches, actually. Yeah. So such people, if they will not repent. So here's a verse on this. This is Matthew chapter 18. This is in line with what you're talking about. You were quoting from Ezekiel earlier. Verse 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you've gained a brother. If he doesn't, take one or two others along with you that the charge may be established by two or three witnesses. So you take him to the church leaders. And if he refuses to listen to the church, let him be to you as a tax collector now what we mean by that a gentile a tax collector we I don't be one of those <laughs> oh, well exactly uh, a tax collector in that context was collecting taxes for the enemy and so it was someone who deliberately set himself outside of um, local community and society and was working against them that's why tax collector uh, and a gentile is someone who is outside of the jewish faith mm-hmm. that's what it means so in other words throw him out and that is the punishment this is what you do. It's basically like in any club. You won't abide by the rules, so you can't be in the club anymore. But we're not going to come after you with pitchforks. But clubs don't generally do that, do they? I know of golf clubs that if, oh, if yes, you don't okay. wear the right clothing, you're out. Or, or the Boy Scouts or the yeah. Girl Guides or something. Yeah, yeah. It's normal for a club to have certain rules and behaviour. In fact, I used to have a, a youth club in my church in which people would arrive early. It was very, very popular. And then what they would do is they would try and open the door and sometimes push things through the letterbox and the door immediately out you can't have people bashing your door in so they remember the club they were keen they wanted to be in so you could say well yep but that's against the rules you can't try and open the door before we start 
and people were suspended happened again you're out rules like that are important and within the church we're trying to all live in god's way we can't have people within it who are deliberately not Mm. trying to we all let god down we can't live up to god's standards but if you're not even trying in fact you're trying to do something different then tell me why are you here so you know it's that sort of thing go and do something else form your own religion go away now all this is separate to decisions of how you might run this is not to say that you can't run a society or country in a way that would include laws from the old testament and some countries do do that so they would say for example murder is wrong and they would say uh, therefore using the same punishment as in the old testament murderers will be executed that is legitimate. We don't do that in Britain. There are other punishments. Well, maybe but you it can... is because of the New Testament injunction that we should allow people time to realise what they have done wrong, to well, repent of it. Yes, that's a legitimate change. We have that freedom. We are not ancient Israel. The laws of the Old Testament give us insight into how God wants things to be run. But we are not ancient Israel, so we have to then apply them to today. And uh, the way that you would apply, I think that that's perfectly legitimate, uh, saying that, well, murder, if you execute them, we might make mistakes or they might repent or whatever, you know. And so you want to put that in place. I'm sure there are arguments against it as well. But our country, the United Kingdom, has arrived at a particular place there. Now, on homosexuality, there are very few, but there are some countries, Christian countries in Africa, who has a death penalty for for homosexuality you could arrive at that decision but that's the civil government the country making that decision it's not the church doing it they're choosing to apply it, the rules of the bible in a certain way and in the letter to the romans paul says well the, the local magistrate bears the sword for a reason so if you do things that are wrong they have the responsibility to punish not the church we can just mm-hmm. throw you out right? so that's the position so it's very different situation than is portrayed the church isn't trying to tell you what to do just generally It's telling you what to do to be a Christian, Mm -hmm. which is a different point. So then why do you think people are so upset that the church will not change? Is it because they don't like being reminded that there is a God? At a spiritual level, I really believe that underneath, at their heart, or in their conscience, people know that God is real. I think they want him to love them, but more Mm -hmm. than that, they know that he has a claim over right and wrong. This is maybe pushed down and subliminal, but they don't even know they believe it. But the way they behave makes me think that they do. Because, as you say, they have such a strong commitment to making the church change its mind. Whereas Islam, in which all countries that have Sharia law, so Islam in law in place, the death penalty is applied to homosexuality. You know when I said there might be one Christian. But with Islam, if it applies Islamic law... So not all Muslim countries have this. But if they're applying Islamic law, yes, it is. It's the death penalty. So we, as in the Western powers, including America, abandoned Afghanistan to a a Muslim group who've enforced Sharia law. It's death penalty for same-sex relationship. No, you're not encouraged. You don't have a pride parade. You're thrown off a building, I believe, is one of the the punishments. You're you're executed. There is a deafening silence, criticised behaviour. But for the Church of England, you don't just need to tolerate such behaviour. You've got to celebrate it. Yes. Is that what you were trying to say? That they do believe it really, that it's wrong? Yes. And of course, globally, it almost seems to have become a Western article of faith that you have to persuade the rest of the world who don't agree with you, like Muslim governments, say the Russian government, that homosexuality is a good thing. It's like uh, the uh, Western religion. I think people are trying to give it a name and calling it woke or wokeism. Yes. It does seem to have certain tenets of belief. I can normally tell, not in this area, but I can normally tell by the colour of your hair, if you're a woman, especially, if you're going to believe all this, because you tend to dye their hair blue or something like that. And then that means they're a real fundamentalist wokest i say not around here because in wallasey and liverpool is quite popular to dye your hair bright color women often do that and uh, say some men but uh, that's not a sign of wokeism it's a sign of scousism I guess <laughs> if anything as to whether that's laudable or not that's an entirely different matter but that's a fashion thing man but just generally i suppose it's another fashion woke people who want to advertise the fact will tend to um, wear certain things like in all religions and uh, someone who is woke if you want to test with someone see if you agree with this bell we're identifying people now who would hate us for our views in a way that the archbishop is saying they don't in the anglican church and that is they would hate us for believing these things one that uh, some forms of sexual expression should have limits put on them 
we believe that uh, sex is between a man and a woman in a heterosexual relationship where they're committed to each other for life. This is, of course, hateful and angry, so they're very angry about that. And they believe that your sexuality is absolutely fixed. They believe, however, your gender or sex, more correctly, is not fixed. You can change it at will. And if we disagree with them on that transgenderism debate, then they're going to be very, very angry and, oh, they're going to hate us so much. I could list a, a few other things. There's a global warming catastrophe. The world's about to end soon is one of them. Mm -hmm. At the moment, Ukraine is wonderful and Russia is evil. They're not sure about China. White people are bad and people of any other ethnicity yeah. are good, apart from the Orientals, because they're really intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> so they do well anyway yeah. so we ignore them but all the other ethnicities are to be promoted strangely that all men are bad and potential rapists and women are actually stronger despite evidence to the contrary and all those beliefs come together in an irrational sort of blob lack of thought i particularly noticed about well not so much the men thing but that women are wonderful especially oh. since the lionesses <laughs> won the, yes the euros and women this week who have won medals gold medals in the commonwealth games not hearing so much about the men who have done it yes fascinating because if that were the case that they were so good let them play against a men's team <laughs> would you want to see that well no because they would be at the level of a men's team about sort of like um, a sunday afternoon soccer league look they're about that sort of level then you know there's just too much of a difference in mm -hmm. the standard that they would have absolutely no chance i think that it's good that women have their own soccer teams i don't like men's or women's soccer so it's i've got a skin in the game so to speak <laughs> but to pretend that they're better when they're clearly not is part of this wokeism now can we just uh, go back to the church of england then and this claim not hateful in the way that we've just outlined uh, I think woke has taken over the Church of England. Right. I think I'd be inclined to agree with you. And I think that the hate comes from the woke Anglicans and not the reverse. Mind you, let, let me say here and now, you can have woke Baptists, oh, yeah, woke yeah. Methodists, y yes, yeah. woke Catholics, etc., etc. Yes, you can. I've noticed the division now seems to be between the, the woke types and the term is often used being awake sort of the same term mm -hmm. when you realize that their belief system is like a deck of cards it's all falls down as soon as you, you attack the basis for it and uh, people are awake to it or another thing that's sometimes used to describe people who are not always christian but i'll come back to that in a minute but people who have been red pilled Right. A red pill, like a red tablet. I haven't heard of that. OK, well, it's an interesting term because it comes from a very good film, The Matrix. Uh, I've seen The Matrix. Over 20 years ago now, yeah. isn't it? In the first film, our hero, Neo, yes. who is uh, a computer hacker type, he gets a message to follow the white rabbit. And he follows this symbol of a white rabbit on someone's shoulder. He ends up meeting a person who says, all that you experience, the whole of the world, is just a matrix in someone else's pro computer program do you want to see the real world do you want to know what's really going on behind the scenes do you want to see reality in which case take the red pill and he has a red pill in one hand is it or you can take this pill the blue pill if you take that you will go on with this illusion forever you'll be happy but you won't know the truth do you want to take the blue pill or the red pill so someone who's been red-pilled has seen the red-pilled and seen the computer program or sees what's behind reality and sees that all those beliefs that I just outlined are just simply not true. They're manipulation. They're, they're there to control the masses. They're convenient non-truths, convenient for certain people, but not for others. But the main point is that they're not true. And when you see behind it and see how much you've been lied to by people you trusted, such that you're red-pilled, then you can start to see the truth. And many, many people who are red-pilled, who suddenly see all the other things they've been lied to about. You're claiming a man can just become a woman. That's not true. And then they start to see everything else that they've been lied to about. They tend to turn, I've noticed this with several online personalities, who start off atheist. Mm -hmm. They start pretty quickly to believe in God, and many of them become Christians, mm -hmm. because they suddenly see the reality. And the reality is that God is real. Yeah. He is the one who, in the terms of that film, The Matrix, who has designed the computer program and The Matrix. He's behind everything. So mm -hmm. if you trust him, you see what is really going on. Anyway, just to conclude on this discussion of the Archbishop's claim, 
I see such vituperative anger from people yes. who are on the woke side of, that I well, just don't and, believe and people him. who the, the, are not believers either. Yes. It's not as if they're trying to convert no. people to no, secularity. No, they've lost the plot there, lost the plot in the church. If you know better, please tell me, but it seems to me that there's deep, deep anger and hatred within the Church of England. But when I see this deep anger, it's from the woke side, from the pro-sexual perversion or homosexuality side, not the other way around. From my point of view, there's just a sadness that people can't see it and have been deluded uh, to believe Mm -hmm. in the nonsense.